Welcome back to part two of our conversation with Randy Zekman, where he tells us the advantages and disadvantages of owning a rental company, as well as how to hire great people. Keep it right here. Part two is coming up next. Welcome to this edition of Peak Performers Podcast with your host, Thor Conklin. Thor will be sharing the necessary tools, strategies, and psychology you'll need to become a peak performer in any area of your life or business. Thor Conklin here. We give you the tricks, the tips, the tools, the strategy, the technology, and the psychology peak performers use in order to get more done and execute at the highest level. If you know what to do but struggle with getting it all done, or simply want to raise your game to the next level, this podcast is for you. Sit back and enjoy. Finding people. I mean, you've got a big exposure. You got people on roofs. You got people going to people's houses. You know, what's the secret recipe? Now that you said there is no silver bullet or secret recipe, how do you find great people? That's always a big challenge for a lot of people. So, so I have, I have two, fu- I have two funny stories. So I've, I have in my career, I've probably interviewed 10,000 people in my life. And I used to back before I was an entrepreneur, I was in the restaurant business. And I used to about every nine months, I would move to a new, re- new restaurant um, with macaroni grill and uh and and open up a new restaurant and so we'd have to interview you know 500 to 700 people or so to to have a hundred or so person staff which is generally what we hired and um and so uh in all those interviews it becomes uh things become pretty mundane and and uh you can get jaded by how people treat the the interview and so you know i i was always raised if someone's going to take the time to talk to you or or you know interview you for a job you should be respectful and show up on time and and you know do do your best and you know i I have found that that a lot of folks um don't don't do that so um so when we were first starting to to hire at at clean solar um, I, I, we do a two-step process. So my business partner did the first interview and I would do the second interview and then we would kind of get together and share notes and I could go into more, more detail on the interviewing process. Cause there's, cause we're, we're doing some, some interesting stuff with that, with that right now that I'd be happy to elaborate on. Yeah, please. But, but, uh, but the, but, but when, uh, he was doing the first interview for our installers, he sent me over this resume and he said, look at this resume just in an email. And I opened it up and the guy was a professional wrestler. <laughs> and, and and he was you know he was you know he was not going to send him over to me and so I emailed him back and I was like I don't care how this interview goes I am going to interview that guy <laughs> because because of all the cruddy interviews I've had to host in my life uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to get something out of this right and so and so I wanted to talk to him about professional wrestling my my dad really loved uh, professional wrestling growing up and so I, I watched it back in the Bobo Brazil days in the in the in the, in the 70s and uh, and so uh, and so he comes uh, I, he's on our schedule for the day to interview and I had maybe 10 interviews or something that day and so just before his interview I, I had a moment to kind of pause and, and look over and was reminded that this guy was a, was a professional wrestler and so I started thinking to myself okay how many questions do I have to ask to make this a real interview before I jump into just the wrestling questions, which is the real, the real reason this guy has come here into the uh, into our second interview? And uh, and so uh, I ask him the first question, and he gives an answer, and I was like, hmm, that's a pretty pretty good answer. And I asked him another one, he gave me another good answer, and another one, and another one, another one, and and I got about six or seven questions into it, and I was like man, I really like this guy and my 30 minutes is up and I didn't even get to any wrestling questions. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so, and so fortunately I, I purposely set him up as the last interview in case, in case that happened. And so then we got all done and I, and I asked him a bunch of wrestling questions. And, uh, and so he was actually uh, employee number two at clean solar. And he not only was a professional wrestler, but he had started his own wrestling federation that he, that he put on wrestling matches every Friday night at the local like moose lodge or something. And, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and it was just fascinating. He turned out to be a great employee. He worked with us for four or five years, um, and so uh, and so it, it was it was it was pretty pretty fun and pretty funny that that worked out the, the way that it did. So, what are some of the techniques that uh, you use other than uh, find uh, professional wrestlers? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, yeah, we 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 look for uh, professional ninjas as well, and uh, and try try to bring them into the team. 
<laughs> no, so 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 we we've actually started uh, more recently delving into uh, disk profiles, or many people know of Myers and Briggs, and yep. so we, we do a lot of disk profiling and try to find personalities that match uh, different different businesses or different um, jobs within within a company, and you know, kind of having an idea of what profile will match a certain um, a certain um, uh, characteristic for for a job title, um, and then and then what we've recently started exper- experimenting with, I, and, and I think with pretty good success, is is we we've identified eight. Um, personality traits that are important to be successful in that particular job. And so we've literally kind of exhaustively sat down and went through uh, a, a list of, of about 33 different personality traits that 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 different people have. And, and some are stronger at some things than others. So um, um, it's things like uh, self-responsibility or, um, or initiative or uh, patience, you know, these kind of things. And so we identify the eight most important items. And then we do a two interview process. One person asks four, four, of, four uh, of those personality trait questions. And we have between one and three questions per personality trait to find out where they kind of sit with each one of those traits. And then the other person asks uh, an entirely different set of, of questions around other personality traits. And then when we get together afterwards, Words, we can be re- very efficient about okay. Here's what I found out about their initiative, or here's what I found out about their um, their empathy, or w- 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 whatever the topic might be, and then we we compare notes and uh, and come up with the best person on paper. Because at the end of the day, you spend about an hour. Um, talking to folks, and you know, you you basically have to marry them uh, a, 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 after after this one hour date, right. right? And so, and so it's it's uh, there's ultimately a, a lot riding, and uh, and what I have just seen over time is most most people don't know how to interview. They don't they're not systematic or or, or or methodical about how they go through it, and you have to be really really methodical about that process so you can you can actively compare. Um, what what we what, what we often do as human beings in that interview process is someone walks in and we like them we have an attraction towards them in some way uh, but probably mostly because they they they're like us they sit on a similar point right. on the disc spectrum as us and then we hire a bunch of people that are like us and that's not the best way to run a business yeah no no that is not years ago we changed our uh, questions around what our core values of a company were. Uh, obviously, we weren't asking right out of the box, but we were asking multiple questions around the things that we were looking for, and it really, really helped uh, our selection process. It wasn't foolproof, but it certainly we got much better candidates in the door uh, to at least work with uh, when we knew that they at least fit the culture of uh, of a firm. Yep. What do you think's going to happen with solar? Uh, you know, I- I've got my own views on it. I'm not in the industry. I, I think it's a fantastic space to be in. I think it's a growing space. We got, you know, Elon making uh, solar shingles. We've got to do something about fossil fuel. You know, it's, it's so interesting because years ago, when the whole electric, you know, cars came about, I'm a, I'm a car guy. All right. So I I like fast cars, big engines, you know, and uh, I'm like, Electric cars? You got to be kidding! Now, those guys out in California, they can drive their electric cars. I'm not doing the electric car thing. Now, of course, we have Tesla, which is faster than most production, you know, exotic sports cars. It's the way of the future. It's it, you know, gasoline engine cars are are going away. Solar is going to be a huge market going forward. You know, is every house going to have its own power system from solar? Um, n- n- knows the answer to that because the, the 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 circumstances have to be right for solar to make sense. Um, and so you know the, the easy thing is if you got a bunch of trees around your house, you're probably not going to have solar on your home. <laughs> and and so and so the, the the state of California did a study about ten years ago, maybe about maybe about fifteen years ago now, as uh, as far as what percentage of buildings in the state of California were kind of solar um, ideal for solar. And the and the the number was thirty eight percent of of buildings were actually ideal for solar, and uh, and and I've seen some recent statistics that that number has grown a little bit um, based on some of the different methodologies that they, that they're using now versus back then, and and different um, technologies that um, make shading a little bit less of a factor. Um, but uh, but but uh, you know I think the grander point is 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 fifty percent of buildings at least in the state of California w- w- won't ever have uh, won't ever have solar, 
which is which is fine at the end of the day if you've got you know in most markets you've got one percent or less adoption rate um so going from a, an entire population of one percent to fifty percent is is it's a huge market right yeah. and uh and so and so that was clearly something that attracted me to to solar early on i you know the the the, the roi when i looked at this business about 13 years ago was was there for anyone who had an electric bill that was over about 150 or 200 dollars, and and we would see paybacks of seven or eight years, and you would see if you looked at solar as a 25 year investment, you would see um, return on investments of somewhere between 20 and 35 percent, and so you know if 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 I said to you or someone else, hey, give me a dollar and uh, and and I'll I can. I can turn that into a dollar twenty or a dollar thirty-five, and the only thing that has to happen is the sun just has to keep on shining. <laughs> um, it's it's a it's it's a low to no risk proposition for a super high return rate. So yeah. so, so 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 it just makes sense that 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 we're going to continue to have um, adoption in places that have high electric bills. So it, it, the, the the other key part is is you have to you have. For, for for solar, there's 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 a ton of stuff, and most people think that oh, California leads the way because it's sunny California. You get more solar, you get more sun there, so on and so forth. And so you know that certainly helps. But the, but there's actually no point in the United States in the continental 48 that that gets um, um, less than two thirds of where the highest point is. So if you take you know Seattle versus Arizona, those are kind of the the uh, Phoenix Arizona. Those are kind of the kinds of the highs and the lows. Yeah. Um, there's there's like a there's a 66 percent um, uh, or a 33 percent difference, right? So it's you get 66 percent of the actual um, insolence in Seattle as you do in, in Arizona. So, so 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 that part of it's very little. It's it's really more about high electric bills and the um, and and the people that live in the area, um, and so California is certainly um, is certainly focused on renewables, and uh, and you know I don't see that changing any time in the next couple of decades. And we've been fortunate; solar's been kind of the poster child for renewables, more so than you know um, uh, tidal tidal energy or wind energy or any of that. So solar has been been uh, been the most. And uh, and the thing we have going for us now with our current administration is is the is the amount of jobs that that solar actually creates. So even though a different uh, political party might not be as keen to, um, you know, global warming facts or um, or any of those things, it's you know, it's hard to point. Uh, it's it's hard not to notice the hundreds of thousands of, of jobs that uh, that the solar industry has created. I've got to ask this question. The chocolate fountain business, the largest one uh, rental group in California, what's it like owning a rental company? So, um, so I, uh, I used to run restaurants for a living and, um, and we, uh, we were, we were a high volume restaurant. So I, so, so, so I knew the food industry pretty well and I wasn't, I wasn't afraid of, of, the details of business and food because I, I managed on a pretty deep level, um, and so the chocolate fountain rental business was much simpler than the, than, the, than the restaurant business. But you know how, how I came across that business was um, I, at the time I had a publishing business and was looking to start another business, and so I went through my my process. And during during that time where I was kind of open to two ideas, I was reading the USA Today. And on a picture, the, the front page of the life section of the USA Today was a picture of Shaquille O'Neal curled up around a chocolate fountain in, in, in his living room. He actually had his own personal one in his living room. And so, and so I was like, "Whoa, what is that thing?" And uh, and so I started researching chocolate fountains. And one of my um, one of my one of my uh, particular items I look for in industry is. I look for businesses where people um, people want to be in them. Having been in the restaurant business for seven, eight, seven to eight years, uh, um, there was th- there was nobody in that space that really wanted to be there, and so and so I started looking for. Um, businesses where people wanted to be in them and and so the chocolate fountain business and the solar business both kind of fit those profiles where uh, people wanted to work around chocolate because who doesn't love chocolate 
and uh, and the solar industry kind of the same thing. You can take construction workers that are you know working with um, you know plumbing or or uh, or electrical or, or whatnot, and and working in the solar industry and having kind of a greater purpose will, will attract uh, will attract better better um, better people or people that, that want something. So the so the, the the chocolate fountain industry kind of started that way. And when I started doing research on it, I, I realized that there was no McDonald's of the industry. There was no one that was kind of dominating it. It was very fractured. It was just local mom and pop businesses. And so I thought at the very least, we'd have a good little local business because with my publishing business, most most people don't realize um, that that my publishing business was really closely tied to the chocolate fountain rental business. It's not very intuitive to necessarily think that. But the, but the publishing business was an advertising business and we were making visitor information guides. And so all of the, all of our customers were uh, with the publishing business were uh, hotels, restaurants, massage places, golf courses, all that kind of stuff. And all those places are the people are the places where people go and have parties and rent chocolate fountains. So I basically knew every hotel owner in town. I knew every restaurant owner in town. I knew um, all the all the event places in town through the publishing business. So at the very least, I thought I'd have a good little local business because I knew everybody and they'd rent from me versus versus somebody else. Um, and at the at the at the very height of it, we could become the McDonald's of the industry and sell chocolate and sell chocolate fountains and rent in all these cities across the country. And so we were the largest chocolate fountain rental company in North America, renting in the 25 largest cities in the United States. And it was a it was a it was a fun little fun little run for the for the 12 or so years that I had that business, and I sold it about two years ago. Okay, I I love a business where you you know you take your inventory you well the, the chocolate you sell but you know the, the machinery you rent it and then it comes back and then you get to rent it again and it comes back uh, i just you know why sell it once sell it multiple times so um I'm, I'm always i love hearing from entrepreneurs and and why they've got into certain industries and you know i'm the type of guy that walks down main street and I'm looking left, I'm looking right, and I'm like, there's a brand new build out, of somebody building out a clothing store, and I'm like, what are they thinking? It's like, you know, <laughs> this is this is not gonna work, you know. <laughs> no matter how you slice it, you need some yep. profits at some point to keep the doors open. Yep. Unless there's yep. an un- unlimited, uh, you know, reservoir there uh, somewhere. If you're not getting the results you want and need, I guarantee no one's holding you accountable. Now, let's face it. Who really wants to be held accountable? Not me, right? Nobody. Why would you want to be held accountable? It's not part of our nature. However, if you want to get exceptional results, you must be held accountable. For $95 a month, our team will hold you accountable to those goals that you want to accomplish in any given month. If you don't like it, ask for your money back. But truly, if you're not getting the results... It's because no one's holding you accountable. The only question is, are you willing to step up? Keep an eye out for part three of our interview with Randy, where he tells us the importance of soft costs, in addition to the future of solar. See you next time on Peak Performers Podcast. Podcast.